The Guardian. Hello and welcome to the Guardian Football Weekly. So it'll be PSG, Manchester City and Real Madrid, Chelsea in the semi-finals of the Champions League. Jude Bellingham scares City before the vastly more experienced Phil Foden wins it. How did Pep get it right? Not overthinking it, just thinking it perhaps. And does this mean Foden is better than Sterling? And does that mean that Sterling has to go to West Ham? Liverpool knock at Real Madrid's door repeatedly, but no one from the wily old stages lets them in. So who's going to win the competition? And are Real Madrid the good guys? Troy Townsend will join us as we discuss Andre Cudela's 10-game ban for racism. It's 10 years of the WSL. Has it been a good decade? Susie Rack will tell us. All that, a weekend preview, your questions, and that's today's Guardian Football Weekly. On the panel today, Mark Langdon of the Racing Post. Welcome. Hello, Max. Hello, Nicky Bandini. Morning. And hello, Barry Glendenning. Hello. Uh, let's start then with uh, Borussia Dortmund 1. Uh, Manchester City 2. Uh, uh, vaguely interesting stat from producer Joel, who fills the script with incredibly uninteresting stats that I edit out <laughs> in the morning. Uh, in the Champions League history, the side winning the first leg of a knockout stage tie 2-1 at home have been eliminated f- more often than they've progressed. So well done to Manchester City for overcoming that. Uh, should we praise them, Mark, for overcoming initially what looked like it might be another City quarter-final because they started so cautiously and so unlike Manchester City play. Yeah, I, I think you do deserve praise when you reach the semi-final of the Champions League. Of Borussia Dortmund made life difficult. They've not done very well in the Bundesliga this season, but you look at that team on paper and they are capable of um, causing any team problems. They were 2 new up at Bayern Munich not that long ago. So um, it's it rarely going to be easy uh, in, in the quarterfinal of the Champions League. And you're right that they did start slowly and they did suffer um, the setback. And so often, actually, in the Champions League, Man City have sort of crumbled under those um, setbacks and conceded not just one goal, but a second one has usually followed. You go back to the Anfield um, sort of debacle when they were 3-0 down after half an hour. Son had scored twice inside 15 minutes um, at the Etihad. Monaco got three away goals when they knocked them out. So um, that they have been prone to, the, to those just collapses, really, um, in, in the Champions League. But... At half time, by half time, you felt like they'd grown into the game. They had created opportunities, and you know, over not only that game but the two legs, they fully deserved to go through. And I, I thought it was a, a a good performance from them, given sort of some of the wobbles they'd had in previous Champions League uh, encounters. Uh, Nikki, yeah, I, I mean, I guess the one of the big criticisms that we've heard a lot of Pep in these situations, in these Champions League quarterfinals specifically, is he gets this point of overthinking himself where he seems to have felt in past seasons like he has to mirror other teams. I think there was a lot of talk about that after Lyon last season coming up with this inexplicable, untested 3-5-2. And I guess the season before that against Tottenham, just finding the most Spursy way to lose was what he did to mirror um, Tottenham. Just (laughs) really set yourself up to go through and then find a way not to. Um, but yeah, this has been this has been the idea with Pep that he overthinks things, that he gets too into the detail of individual opponents, and it's almost that he's outthinks himself. And even former players have talked about this. Thomas Muller talked about that um, when he was at Bayern, not really crit- critiquing him, not criticizing him, actually sort of saying, "Look, he's a really advanced thinker in how he thinks about football, but he can get into this." And is it possible that Dortmund were just really easy? for Pep to to do that with, you know, compared to some of the other teams that you might line up against. Because Dortmund in lots of ways want to play like City, actually. Dortmund want to do the same sort of football that City do, but aren't as good at it. And both teams kind of are quite comfortable to line up in a 4-3-3, for instance. It's not actually necessarily Dortmund's natural wheelhouse, but when you take out Sancho, it's something they've gone to before. I think maybe this was a very um, comfortable matchup for City, much more so than what they're going to face in the next round, I think even against PSG. I like the idea, Barry, that the real success is when Pep underthinks things or doesn't doesn't bother even thinking at all. You know, that he's got to such a stage where really what, what they're telling him to do is stop thinking and just, you know, or not bother, and then he'll be absolutely fine. Um, Ian says... And I think this is more a question for Mark, but I'll, I'll throw it to Barry. Which is more mouthwatering, 
A, deep fried butter dipped in lard, or B, Phil Foden. But Baz Foden, Foden has been like crucial for these two games, hasn't he? You know, not single handedly won them the tie, but being like the linchpin. You know, we extol his virtues on this podcast on a regular basis. There's not a huge amount left to say about him. He's very good. If I was an England fan, I'd be really happy to see, you know, that two of the key players in this tie were a 17-year-old Englishman and a 20-year-old Englishman who may not even make the first team uh, at the Euros, uh, Gareth Southgate's first team. I suspect Foden will. I'd be bewildered if he doesn't. But um, I'm I'm not sure what more there is to say about him. He, he looks like the finished article, even though he's only 20 years old. There's very little he can't do. I think it's... Um it's it's interesting, isn't it, with Foden? Um, like uh, Baz saying, you can't imagine him not being in that England team. And I think for a long time, a lot of people looked at the City team and thought, you can't imagine why, even as good as City are, why he's not getting more minutes. I mean, it's only a year or two ago, he's on England under 21 duty and giving these pretty sort of snarky comments at times about, I'm not getting any minutes uh, at City, so it's a good thing I get a chance over here. But clearly despite all that, never was sort of interested in leaving, always wanted to be at City, always clearly had this great relationship with um, Guardiola. And I guess it was one of the narratives coming into this tie. Unfortunately, Sancho wasn't there yesterday, but this idea that you had these two who started off together and then went went their separate ways and one got to play a lot of minutes early and the other one didn't. And a couple of years down the line, well, they're both doing great, actually. They're both doing absolutely fine. So maybe... We don't really um, get any uh, learning point from that in terms of one route being better than the other. Before, Max, in your... uh, You don't normally do it, but for some reason you threw to me with the question (laughs) about a comparison of butter and a man. Um, (laughs) I I was just thinking... I, I was wondering if possibly there... Is there a case to be argued that Borussia Dortmund, and this is something Wilson comes out with occasionally, did they score too early? Because Manchester City were playing not not particularly badly, but not with any great ambition in the opening 15 minutes. And then as soon as uh, Bellingham scored, it was like a, a, a switch had been flicked and they just, you know, electroshocked them into, oh, crikey, we, be- we better do something here. And I, what I just minute, think, what minute do you think they should have scored in? Well, that's what I'm wondering. Like, when, when is, because at some point you're you're going to be leaving it a bit too late. But um, I think if they had just kept City at arm's length as as they did until Bellingham scored, and then the the pace after that was just absolutely frantic, and there was no way both teams were going to be able to keep that up for over an hour, and and so it came to pass I, I think it's great that Baz used the phrase arm's length there because all I've got in my head is if Emery Chan just keeps the ball maybe not right next to his arm then this tie could go very differently I mean it was a bizarre way to let City back in really I, I don't think that made that much of a difference to be honest I, I think City there was they were not going to lose that game do you think but still you do wonder what Emery Chan's doing I, I initially thought that isn't a penalty because he headed it first. Uh, Dale Johnson, who's a good man to go to, ESPN, said, look, the ball deflecting off the body onto the arm does not cancel a penalty if the defender's arm is extended well away from the body. I mean, he could have just kicked it. But I suppose once you start leaning, then you're just leaning, aren't you? And then you, you think, well, I'd better keep leaning. Chris says, if a player falls in the forest and there's nobody else around, does Peter Walton believe it's a penalty? <laughs> because on BT in the UK, they crossed to Peter Walton who said, that isn't a penalty. And then <laughs> VAR decided it was a penalty. And then everyone said, yes, the rule is that is a penalty. And Peter Walton just carried on sitting in that little box that he sits in. I I mean, Peter Walton's become quite the figure of fun in recent months since he started working for BT because of how many things he gets wrong. But I, I do find it generally... Worrying because I'm not one of these people who has conspiracy theories about referees, and I am one of these people who think they do their best, they know what they're doing, and but they are doing their best under difficult circumstances and occasionally make mistakes. He doesn't appear to have a clue what he's talking about, <laughs> and he he had quite a distinguished career as a referee, and I that 
that frightens me. Like, how many fair, more there, there people are, like him are there out there refereeing <laughs> football matches? There are lots of laws. That's why none of us have read them, because there's just so many. It's I've hard, read them. isn't it? Have you all of them? Yeah. Have you read them, Nikki? I I have not necessarily Sam read them in one go, but I've had to go okay. through them quite a few times, so probably I've read them all over time. Oh, wow. Mark? It's not something I do on a regular basis. Right? <laughs> I, I I would occasionally, if if I feel like I'm sort of on my own with you know watching a decision and, and sort of going against the, the general opinion, I will uh, refer back to the laws just to to make sure oh. that I am wrong. Usually, I am. Um, oh, if I'm I need of... to get a I need to get the laws. I'm the yeah. I'm the one here. It's, I'm the it's outlier. Good toilet reading. <laughs> you can just pick it up, pick it, put it down, dip in and out. How impressive, Mark, was it that that City kept Erling Braut Haaland quiet for essentially for both legs? He set up one in the first leg, but he, he didn't second. have the impact on. He set up in this leg. Yes, okay, that's true. Um, <laughs> they kept him really on a really tight rein, didn't they, Max? <laughs> well, I he think they a, did. Played a key part in both goals they conceded. <laughs> <laughs> I still think they did. Do you, Mark? Maybe I'm wrong. I thought I thought I have seen Haaland do more in other games. Yeah, I mean, he has done more in, in other games. I mean, usually when Borussia Dortmund play, as long as it's not against Bayern Munich, um, and even when it's against Bayern, I suppose he, he gets more opportunities. So um, that would be a rare kind of game for him and probably would have been one that maybe teams that are looking to buy Haaland would sort of... How does he done against Manchester City when Dortmund aren't attacking as much and they're not creating as many chances? And actually, I, I think he did show other sides to his game with the assist in, in the first game and um, the way he, he kind of helped Bellingham get the second goal as well. And so th- th- there probably was more to take out of Haaland's sort of two-legged performance uh, because we know he can score goals. He scored a lot of them already. Um, but this was a, a different side to him where, you know, Dortmund were struggling and I, I still felt he, he did well. He's definitely not underrated, I think it's fair to say. And there's a, there's a lot of hype around him and, and some of it does get a, a little bit too much for me. But he's definitely, I think, shown in the games against City that, that he's capable of doing more than just score goals. We've touched on Jude Bellingham, but he was, even before he scored, I mean, the guy, Nicky, is just effortless as a footballer, isn't he? Oh, he's, yeah, he's really exciting to watch and um, a bit sort of mind-boggling to think he's 17 years old um I always find it there's that awkward moment when um a player that age in English scores because they'll always bring up the list of youngest English Champions League goal scorers and every time maybe this is just me with like my embedded Arsenal neuroses every time I see those lists and I see Theo Walker on them I think all right well there's your reminder not to get ahead of yourself and assume that someone's going to become everything that you hope for them and are projecting onto them because sometimes it doesn't go quite not that Walcott had a terrible career, but doesn't go quite the way that you imagine when someone's that age and, and doing something. But he's he's really um, a beautiful footballer to watch. And I, I thought it was something probably encouraging from a coaching standpoint in his reaction after the game as well, because he was interviewed on, on BT Sport and they were asking him, oh, you know, wasn't that a, a, a great night? And he was like, well, it's not a great night when you lose I don't care about scoring a goal when I lose and I think probably that's exactly what managers want to hear from a young player who could be getting ahead of himself and could be getting egotistical about doing something like that. City play PSG in the semi-final then um, and uh, it's Pep's first semi-final as a Manchester City manager Uh, he's got to uh, the same number of semi-finals as Jose Mourinho now so that's uh, Good for him, isn't it? Uh, let's go to Anfield then. Liverpool nil, Real Madrid nil. Baz, Liverpool started this game brilliantly. I almost moved them from the laptop to the telly. I almost did a swap because of how well Liverpool began this game. But you've just got the feeling they they were never going to score. I didn't think Liverpool really threatened Real Madrid yesterday. There was that more Salah miss in the second minute, which was quite surprising. You You would expect him to score that. Uh, most of the time, but I, I didn't think... I, I, I thought their performance was a little like Porto's against Chelsea. They did it okay, but never really looked in much doubt the, the ultimate outcome. Mm, the front three, Mark, aren't as good as they were a couple of years ago. Is that, you know, is is 
is that form is temporary, class is permanent, and they'll come back in a, a year or two, or is it time to ship them all off and get some new ones? I wouldn't get rid of all of them. I, I was surprised that Jota didn't start. Uh, I felt that he's done enough really over um, sort of the last few, well, since he signed for Liverpool to say that he could and should be ahead of Firmino. I know that Firmino does um, some, some good work with the linking, but even that wasn't really there um, last night. There were a couple of moments where he could have played in a teammate and maybe he would have done 18 months ago and the pass just wasn't there. Uh, so I, I was like I said, I was surprised really with the team selection. Even in midfield, I felt that Thiago, that was a game that was crying out for somebody that could get on the ball and try to make something happen because particularly in the second half, Liverpool became a bit like sort of David Moyes' sort of Manchester United team where they, they got it wide and put crosses into absolutely nobody. They didn't even have a Fellaini there and there was that bit right at the end where Klopp got really frustrated uh, with like, how many times are we going to do this in sort of the, the 93rd minute where just another aimless cross went in and I felt like they needed to uh, be a bit smarter on the ball really because Real Madrid were, were sat in. I, I disagree with Barry in terms of the chances. I felt that, that not only the Salah one, Wijnaldum, uh, had a really good opportunity just before half time, and maybe that will have sort of changed the dynamic of the tie. But um, there, there is a lack of efficiency up front for sure, and it's not just been in this game. This has been going on for several months, and I, I think it will be a concern definitely um, for, for, for Jurgen Klopp because all the focus has been on the issues at the back, um, but the, the front three haven't got the team out of trouble often enough. And Barney Rone writing about um, Phillips and Kabak, saying at least they're slow in different ways. <laughs> Kabak in the more muscular, controlled way. Phillips gangly, slow, moving into top gear with all the grace of a collapsing scaffold. The thing is, Nicky, you know, the thing about injuries is you sort of, for, for about four or five games when you're missing a player, you say, look, it's really key. And then we kind of like move on as if that doesn't matter anymore. But like, it's a big deal. Like, it's a big deal not having Van Dijk and Gomez and Matip and Henderson. I mean, I know Real Madrid, of course, are missing yeah. a bunch of players as well. I mean, that's the thing with that argument, isn't it? You can cut it the other way and say Real Madrid. I think Ferland Mendy was the only member of their back four who would be first choice normally. So mm-hmm. I think there's been all sorts of of, of those sorts of underlying um, factors that probably haven't got as much attention as they could have done. I think that fixture congestion at certain times has hit certain teams really hard all over Europe and has made a huge difference and maybe even Real Madrid and how they started this season Real Madrid were awful at a certain point in the group stage they barely um got through after well in the end it kind of got comfortable because of everyone else in the group but they did lose to Shakhtar twice I think there's all sorts of those factors going on and and it's like actually the other thing which I guess everyone was talking about um after this game, or, or I heard a lot of anyway, was this um, issue of Liverpool suddenly not being able to win at the cop, not being able to score goals at the cop. And my mind went back actually to like a really old football week. I can't remember how many years ago this would be, but we were talking about... If, if it was before 2016, it's been struck from it, the record as happened. far as Max is concerned. <laughs> well, let's just say a conversation with Greg Ruffley then, um, or Greg Bukowski. I think that might tell you how long ago this conversation right, was. Right, yeah talking about why home advantage still seems to matter, even though certainly in the Premier League, we're not really talking about atmospheres that are so hot all the time, that are so sort of on top of you. And Greg made this analogy of like, oh, it's just like, you know, when you're at home, you know where the kettle is, you know where you can get your cup of tea, you just know where everything is and that's comfortable and that makes a difference to you. And I was sort of just had that analogy pop into my head and I thought, is there a little bit like some of us are experiencing now of after a year of pandemic, being at home feels suffocating. Like I just need to get out of this box that I've been in. And is that how it's starting to feel for for Liverpool players in an empty cup? Like, oh God, I just want to be anywhere else than this um, this sort of enforced home that we've put up with for, for a long time. Yeah, I think we'd have to go back in time, <laughs> not have the pandemic and then have two different like Back to the Future, like the Almanac one and the non-Almanac one, and we could see who wins the league with fans and who without. Can we it's tricky that? to organise, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, Liverpool have condemned the fans who smashed the uh, Real Madrid coach window as it was uh, driving into Anfield. We condemn unequivocally the actions that led to Real Madrid's team bus being damaged during its arrival to Anfield this evening. It's totally unacceptable and shameful behaviour of a few individuals. Um, yes, like don't throw things at a coach. I mean, it's... 
not rocket science, is it? Um, so Real Madrid played Chelsea in the semi-final. They've never played each other in the Champions League before. Uh, Max asks, if Chelsea are considered to be the plucky, likeable underdogs of the Champions League semi-finalists, is the only way to enjoy the rest of the tournament to lean into schadenfreude knowing three of the four will not win? Nicholas, has there ever been a group of four more unlikable teams than Chelsea, Man City, PSG and Real Madrid? Um, we sort of touched on it yesterday, Barry, didn't we? I mean... It's the nature of football. I wonder if one of the skills with sports washing and uh, uh, look, all four teams are slightly different. And but just the idea of sports washing, one of the successes is it becomes boring talking about it because I want to talk about football. That that's where sports washing succeeds because you just go, oh, I don't want someone else to mention this team that I shouldn't like because I know I shouldn't like them or I know I should question. How, well, their ownership. Well, a lot of people don't question their ownership, and that's the problem. And these people are fans of these clubs who do not give a shit about them. Um, I, w- I woke up this morning to an absolutely deranged email from a Manchester City fan who took grave exception to the fact that I'd, you know, made a waspish comment about the uh, the lineup of the semi-finals in in my minute by minute report last night, and and you know talked about how what a romantic lineup it was to have these plucky underdogs in in the last four um he you know it was an exercise in venality or not venality in in just it was nasty it was spiteful it was uh an exercise in total what about her just ill-informed gibberish and i'm really looking forward to these two semi-finals i'm not looking forward to the build-up because you can't get away from the fact that two of the teams in this uh, semi-finals who are playing each other are owned by countries that are run by tyrannies, and and you cannot not mention that. Mark, yeah, I think it's really strange here, but Real Madrid are, are the the most sort of I suppose likable in some respects of, of the quartet, and you know for so long Real Madrid were you know the, the Galacticos and spending sort of grotesque amounts of money, but actually they haven't done that. I mean this season they didn't buy one player in, in the summer, and they you know for financial reasons got rid of a lot of kind of the, the squad men. So Reguilón went, Akimi uh, left for Inter. Um, you know, Bale and James Rodriguez were another two that departed. And the squad is really thin. And if you go through it player for player, uh, most people would kind of go, well, you know, uh, in terms of like the, the real quality, it's not really there. And, you you know, someone like Modric over the hill, Crows not as good as he was. You know, Ramos is, is coming towards the end and, and, and stuff like this. But yet... Actually, they've they've found a way to get to the the Champions League semi finals, and maybe they are sort of different this season anyway to to some of the others. I mean, Chelsea I think spent the most, didn't they, in in Europe this summer, and Real Madrid um, did not spend one euro on on a new player. So yeah, it's interesting. I like the idea of you know on just before the final. And they interview you. This is Luca. He's a dustman by day, but he plays central <laughs> midfield for Real Madrid by night. But I, I take it's your very point. Much, it's very much the, the narrative around them. And I've sort of, you know, been one of those that sort of hasn't given Zidane probably as much credit as he deserves. And I, I would sort of, you know, always question, well, like, what's the, the long-term project and where's the process? But um, he, he does get results. And, you know, there's something to be said, I think, for the way that he's achieved that. Um, sort of in a really difficult summer for them where they're not playing their home games at the Bernabeu, they've not signed a player and here they are, you know, I think many people would now put them favourites for La Liga and they're in the semi-finals of the Champions League. Europa League tonight, the biggest story of course is Manchester United changing the colour of the banners covering the seats at Old Trafford from red to black in an effort to win more home games. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer saying some of the players have mentioned that split second decision you have to make where you look over your shoulder and see if your teammate is there or not. The red shirt is on a red background with red seats. Thomas says, with this news, how long before teams start changing the banners on seats each week to match the shirt colour of the opposition? And then <laughs> they'll second guess about away kits or not and suddenly you'll just see people, stewards running around changing the <laughs> banners to the colour of the kit that the away team have turned up in. Anyway, um, uh, the Europa League is tonight. We might mention it on Monday if anything interesting happens. Uh, that'll do for part one. Uh, part two, Troy Towns then will join us and we'll talk about Andre Kudela and his 10-game ban for racism.
Welcome to part two of the Guardian Football Weekly. Uh, so Slavia Prague's Andre Kudel has been banned for 10 matches after racially abusing Glenn Kamara, with the Rangers midfielder suspended for three games for assaulting Kudela in the tunnel after the game. Kamara's account was supported by his Rangers teammates, Bongani Zungu, and UEFA's control ethics and disciplinary body found Kudela guilty of using racist language. Uh, Troy Townsend from Kick It Out uh, joins us. Hey, Troy, nice to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, Max. Not too bad. Glad to be rolled out again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm... <laughs> Listen, you're very good. It's very good of you to come on and discuss these things. One day, I said, Troy, you and I will do a podcast on you did. 90s music. One you day did. we will. Yeah, you um, did. And one day it'll happen. I mean, no one will listen to it, Troy. But you know, it's a dream of ours. Um, so look, what, what I've seen your reaction on Twitter, but what was your reaction to to this? <laughs> yeah, you saw my reaction. Um, that was the mellowed down version, I think. To be honest, Max, uh, you know. I always think that we tend, well, personally, let me, let me not speak for anyone else. You kind of live in hope that the same mistakes would not be made and made again by, you know, the governing bodies of our game. So you think that at some stage they really are going to take matters seriously and, and, and hand out a punishment that shocks us all. You know, I don't know if you remember. Do you remember the, the Champions League cat? Um, yeah. A couple of seasons ago, that got fined, the basic tax got fined 30, 30 euro, 30,000 euros. And you kind of think to yourself, you know, let, let's go all out here, UEFA. You know what I mean? Let, let's, let's double what that cat's got and let's, um, you know, really put a sanction in. And I'm sorry to make a joke of it all, but it is a joke. It's a fast. Um, he's been found guilty. Um, I thought it was a real cowardly way what he did there. And I'm not even mentioning his name today. Real cowardly what he did to Kamara there. Um, something that he'd obviously thought about as well. I don't think that's a spontaneous moment. I think that's playing on someone's mind that at some stage, because of how heated the game was as well, he was going to target one of the, uh, Rangers' black players. Um, so to give him the minimum punishment, to to make one of those punishments uh, a game that he was never going to play in anyway because he, he refused to come to uh, England, um, although it was said that he wasn't well, those games are covered by European Euro, Euro 2020 games anyway. So actually, it's going to finish a lot quicker than what it would have done, even if he's not selected for, well, if he's selected for the, the Euros. I just, honestly, when you put it all together, it again, I was going to say speechless, but I'm talking quite a lot, aren't I? So I'm not speechless. But it just leaves me wondering where we go at this stage. Troy, do you think that UEFA's reluctance to, to hand out a, a serious punishment... Is it something to do with the fact that they think if we hand out a serious punishment, that means we're acknowledging racism is a big problem and we don't want to do that because it's bad for the image? It's a great question, Barry. But, you know, on, on every Champions League game and, and, and whatever else it may be, there's a little logo on the left-hand side of, of everyone's sleeve, isn't there, that says, say no to racism. You know, and if that's the only thing that they have as an image of, of, of their way of showing that we mean business here then that, that's not enough. I actually think they're frightened that if they set a precedent in something like this case, you know, a, a minimum sanction, or sorry, a sanction that goes above and beyond what anyone has done in football, by the way, anyone. So that includes us as well in this country. So let's not sit on our high horse about this. Um, then that they're going to have to continue to follow through. And I don't think they want to follow through on those actions. You know, for me... A message or banned until further notice. Banned until um, meeting certain requirements. You know, things like that need to come into play. I, I saw Kamara's agent yesterday saying he was expecting a year. Now, whilst I was really pleased with what he said, I'm also thinking, well, I don't know where he's got that from. Why would he ever expect a year? It's never been in UEFA's kind of rule book. I don't know how many pages it's got, but that they would, you know, sanction someone for a year. But is that what it takes, Barry? But yeah, listen, everyone looks at sponsors. Everyone looks at the credibility of the, the organisation and then the competition. And that all plays on their mind. Let's not get this twisted. That plays on their mind without doubt. Johnny Lou wrote a brilliant piece, Troy, about the victim in a situation like this, who in the milliseconds after an incident, while dealing with kind of shock, anger, sadness, has to be taking notes in their head about exactly what's happened for when it's investigated and it, and it and it really articulated it brilliantly about 
us trying to get to a stage where a victim is is believed. The piece was outstanding, to be totally honest. But I tell you now, I bet you the people who should have uh, been reading that piece were not reading the piece. Um, I don't think the victim is at the forefront. When when you know these organisations are putting together their plan of how you know once they've read all their submissions and put together their plan of how they're going to treat the perpetrator. Do I think that they actually think about the impact of, you know, whatever abuse it is, but in this case it's racial abuse on an individual? Do they really appreciate the fact that Slavia Prague escalated the impact on Kamara by calling him a liar publicly, um, which then has led to him every single day since that game receiving more abuse from on social media platforms? which also you must have been aware of the banner that the Slavia Prague fans put out and the wording that was on that banner. So I'm going to say here, not only should UEFA have been considering what ban they were going to do to the player, they should also have been considering what action they were going to take against the football club because the football club condoned the behaviour. So at that moment, we should be talking about multiple offences here. They condone the behaviour. But going back to your kind of question, Max, that lived experience never goes away from you. That lived experience of being, you know, like I said, it was a cowardly thing that the player did to Kamara. That lived experience is now going to stay not only with him, with his immediate family because of all the fallout now, the way he's been targeted, the thought process of thinking, I wonder if it's going to happen again. You know, what? You know, this game's a bit heated. I wonder if that's going to happen again. Just in your everyday life now, experiences like that never go away. Never, ever go away. You try to push them to the back of your mind. You try to think to yourself, I'm not going to let this get the better of me. But I tell you now, you've got to be some person to be able to do that. And do I think you for a thought about that? Not at all. Not at all. And do you think, or how do you navigate? And, and in this situation, uh, Kamara was, you know, his, his account was supported by a teammate. But when you have the situation when it's one person's word against another... And I've heard so many people say, well, how can you make a judgment? Because you don't know, because we don't know what's said. How, and, uh, how do you navigate that? Yeah, but Max, oh, of course that is difficult. But all I would say to you, why does it always lean towards the person that has done the deed? Why, does, why is that always the fact then that the victim has to prove that he's been victimised, they've been victimised? And go through that experience. You know, you just spoke about Jonathan Liu's piece. Mm. Go through all the experience that that has created in, a, in an instance, but then relive it, recount it, run through the whole process again. You know, so, uh, yeah, it, it is a difficult thing. And I, and I would say, but at no point does it, does it weigh in favour of the victim. It always weighs in favour of the perpetrator. And for me, that's not balance. That's not correct. So now I have to... You know, me, I, I use me as an, an example. I have to now put together everything that happened in the build-up at the moment and afterwards to prove sure. that I've been racially abused. He called him an F monkey. You know, if, if, if that is still allowed in 2020, okay, in our game of football, then what you are going to have, and I think Kamara said it, should have walked off. That's what's going to happen. It's going to set a precedent now where players, clubs, because of the support that Kamara received, you know, in that moment, we'll think, well, what's the point? Nothing happens. Look what happened to Glenn. You know, he didn't really... I know he's had to live through this. It's better off that we go and then we'll fight in the courts. Simple as that. And we, again, Max, we saw what happened in Spain recently as well, didn't we? When Valencia walked off and walked back on again. Hmm. These are the things that are happening at the moment, you know, and it, and it's it's a tough one. Um, but I don't see that at any stage that the situation... Um, and, and I'm using benefits, but I, I probably don't mean benefits, but ways on the victim's side. Um, and, and I wouldn't want anyone to have to go through the experience of reaccounting experiences like what Glenn Kamara had to. Troy, you spoke You spoke um, just when you come on first. You, you made light of the fact that you were being wheeled out again. <laughs> do, do you ever wish you hadn't put yourself in, in the spotlight to, to fight this battle? Oh, Barry, what a tough one that is. Listen, there are massive low moments when you're fighting discrimination. There are low moments when you're talking up on behalf of many that don't have a platform and don't have a voice, to be totally honest. Um, I'll be honest with you, there were periods at the back end of last year, 
because of a certain documentary and the way that I was accused of, you know, going against the the, the FA um, or I was accused of lying. Basically, I was accused of lying when I actually thought time's up, enough's enough. I can't do this. You know, my evidence, everything that I say and everything that I give is factual, by the way. So when I when I when I speak, I speak because I do my homework. I speak because I make sure I'm aware of what's going on around me. But it's almost like a responsibility that I've taken on without accepting it. But I'm glad to continue to do it because the amount of people that touch base with me, Barry, to be totally honest, and the amount of people that drive me on to continue to speak in this space where they feel that their voices would never be heard. So it was, I am making light of it because I do have other attributes. I know no one really appreciates that, but I, you know, there's little bits of value. Steady on, steady on, Troy. (laughs) I could add value in, you know, I know how to score a goal. I know what it, I know how to dissect a game, but listen, no, uh, I've had low moments that have said to me, but maybe you should step away, Troy. There's got to be an easier life somewhere else, but, Ultimately, I, I appreciate and value my responsibility in this space, Barry. What do you make of um, some football clubs stepping away from social media for a week? Um, sort of my instant reaction was, at least they're doing something. I don't imagine Mark Zuckerberg is going to be, you know, losing sleep over it. No, I'm, pr- I'm, I'm proud of the clubs. It's a stance. It's a stance that no one else has taken at the moment, but you're absolutely right. Does it register on the thick Richter scale of Facebook? I nearly swore then. Do you know that? Does it register? Okay, on you're the... allowed to on this. <laughs> oh, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Go Does for it... your life. <laughs> I should have told you that a couple of years ago, Troy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um... <laughs> That's some fruitier podcasts. <laughs> I mean, does it register really on the Richter scale of Facebook and Instagram? Does football register on on the Richter scale? To be honest, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So I'm proud of the clubs because, you know, it means that the conversation continues and it means that actually other clubs might be saying, have you seen what Swansea have done? Have you seen what Birmingham have done? And I know there's conversations in the Premier League and I know there's conversations in the EFL about potential of, you know, a a total blackout from, from the clubs. Yeah, listen... We've been talking in this space about social media now for forever and a day. Nothing's changed. Um, we're talking about the same things now that we were talking about ten years ago: filtering systems and and you know uh, 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 you know ID systems and and all this stuff. They're the same conversations from ten. If you had had me on ten years ago, Max, I would have said the same thing that I'm saying today. So those social media companies are in control of what they want to do, and they're playing with us. They're playing with the football clubs. They're playing with us as the general public. They're playing with anyone that has been victimised on their platforms because they have the power and the know-how. They're, bo- they're multi-billion dollar businesses, tech industry. Don't tell me that something couldn't have been done five years ago. That means you would not need to be speaking to me about this now. Do you, uh, On this, and I've really, I, I'm not sure what the right thing to do is. At the moment, I feel, you know, any black Asian player has a bad game or loses or doesn't even have a bad game or wins, they'll probably get racially abused on a social media platform. Then people like us, radio stations, TV channels report it and then nothing gets done. And then that is a, that just shows to everyone else, you can do this and you are free to do this. And I, I, I sort of wonder, I wonder if it's right to keep saying this player got racially abused last week. This player did last week. and Because until the social media companies do something, all you're doing is saying, if you want to go and be racist to someone, you can. But if you don't report it, then you're ignoring the problem. I- I'm, I'm conflicted. Yeah, but let's not. we're not the ones that should be judged here. Or the media are not the ones that should be judged here. Or football's not the ones that should be judged here. It's the social media platforms. So anyone that wants to... And, and I know there are players who are just fed up, who actually have said, oh, yeah, I've got racially abused, but you know, I- I'm just keeping it to myself now. There's no point. I'm just keeping it to myself. While there are some that want to be proactive and vocal and and want stuff done about it. You know, we should not be judging the player's right to either identify or to keep to themselves the abuse that they receive. We have obligations in the industry to either raise it and keep raising it. And I know that there were situations that happened last night as well um, after a certain Champions League game. And I won't say it because I'm saying it out of respect for the football club today and the, the enormity of what today is for that football club. But they have their own right. Those players have their own right. And we have to choose as people working in the industry, as, as the media, 
how we amplify the voices and keep the pressure on. Um, and I wouldn't judge anybody for, for you know, saying, I'm going to take a break today. You know, I, I'm not going to highlight that because what's the point? I'll say this, though. West Bromwich Albion's famous victory against Chelsea, and it is a famous victory, by the way, um, and I hope there's no Chelsea supporters uh, on here today, also turned out to be one really bad day for one of the goal scorers because after scoring... So you said after a defeat, after a bad game. Well, he had an absolutely tremendous game. Absolutely tremendous game. Beyond his wildest dreams. Over 70-odd messages of racial abuse from over 20-odd accounts. So you're, 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 at the, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're over the moon. You're ecstatic. And all of a sudden, ever since that day, all you're doing is being hit by monkey emojis, gorilla emojis, banana emojis, the N-word. And just think about having to travel to work to continue to speak about that on a consistent... But yeah, look, there you go. There's another one. There's another one. Yeah, I'm just reporting another one. Something's going to break sooner rather than later. Something's going to break in a professional sports person. And unfortunately, they're going to be judged on, on, on being broken by a system that is not fit for purpose. Troy, as always, thanks for coming on. Um, can we wheel you out soon and just talk about football? I'd love to. I don't think you trust right. me to talk about football. Well, that's, that's the, the only thing. thing. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. When you said you could, and also you said you could dissect a game, and we don't want any of that on this. <laughs> no, more than happy to any stage. You know, I'm always here, Max. So yeah, you right. know, unfortunately, these things still need to be spoken about, don't they? Good man, Troy. All right, take care, guys. That'll do for part two. Uh, we'll be back in a second. Welcome to part three of the Guardian Football Weekly. Uh, it is the 10th anniversary of the Women's Super League. Let's talk to Susie Rack about it. How are you doing, Susie? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. So um, uh, the FA are going to open a Hall of Fame. Uh, Tuesday marked the decade um, when Arsenal uh, beat Chelsea 1-0 in the top flight's first match. Ten years on, if you look at the quality of the players coming into the WSL, the increase in the coverage, is it ahead, behind where you expected it might be? Uh, that's a good question. I think probably where where you would have hoped it would have been, um, perhaps even a little bit behind. You know, I think plenty of people would have liked to have seen us reach this point and this kind of level of coverage a bit quicker, particularly, um, you know, the broadcast deal, you know, that we were, were sort of talking about that at the start of the 10 years and now we've only got it coming in 11 years on next season. That feels... A little bit disappointed when I was looking back at the timeline. I found it really hard actually to look at ten years of WSL because I it's a bit like ninety two with the Premier League and that football didn't exist <laughs> did exist yeah. before then. And uh, a lot of the stats I'm finding really funny, like how many goals players scored in the WSL as opposed to their entire career and things is just a bit bizarre. But um, I think overall. Um, you know, the fact that at the start of the 10 years you had the semi-professional league and now you've got a fully professional league in the broadest sense of the term. Birmingham have shown how unprofessional the professional league is. That's, yeah, a huge step forward. You know, the Barclays deal. I'd say, like, we've really had the main progress in the last about two years, really. And that that broadcasting deal is so huge, isn't it? Because it, uh, I was talking to Kelly Simmons yesterday actually the the head of the professional women's game for the FA about sort of normalizing women's football so you just it's just a, it's just football and it's not every time there's a women's game at the end of it you have to have a discussion about where is the women's game at now which I know is the exact discussion we're having <laughs> this second um and and the number of people that will watch that the number of young girls and boys that will watch that will be sort of more than watch the Premier League on Sky or BT yeah, I can't wait until we're just talking about uh, whether the football is rubbish or not, like just from a footballing point of view, rather than, you know, like discussing where the 
where a player was playing when they were 12 and you know how influential their big brother was in getting them to play and all those kind of backstories they're sort of nice for nice features but when you get them you know kind of week in week out around every single game it gets a bit tiring when when you just want to talk about and analyze football so I'm sort of looking forward to a point at which where it's so big where there's so much of it around that we're not having to delve into those little niche topics to try and entice people that people are already watching it so they want to talk about what they've watched rather than uh rather than all this content that is trying to entice people towards the game so that for me is is the exciting part of it the fact that like it's going to be on bbc one and bbc two you know 10 years ago espn were part of the um the launch of the wsl and had the the some broadcast rights they agreed to broadcast like six games or something like that and they and the deal like very much like the recent one with bt was they would just cover costs of production and there was no money in it for um the league or the teams or the fa so like the fact that now you've got both that financial commitment which is mainly coming from sky and then also the fa and sky and the bbc all thinking a little bit bigger picture about it and saying yeah actually we want the bbc on board and we want this on and we're we're committing to put it on you know bbc one and two rather than just the red button or the website so you know you know you don't have to find it you don't have to seek it out uh and have to already know it exists to be able to watch it it's just there and you can switch it on and it's yeah great Susie, I was thinking about that comparison you made with the Premier League era and when it comes in, everything changes. And thinking about how that actually really changed how England was positioned as a footballing country within Europe. Because prior to that, in the early 90s, was really Serie A heyday. It was Italian football heyday. And things have shifted a lot since then. And I mean, certainly, I can't speak for all over Europe so much, but Italian women's game is some way behind the English women's game. There's been steps forward driven by, as with so much in Italian football right now, certain individual clubs, it feels like, like Juventus starting to pay attention and put money into it. Do you think the WSL can have the same sort of impact for England as a sort of footballing country in, in women's football and positioning England as, as as a hub in the same way as perhaps the Premier League has over time really escalated the financial possibilities certainly for Premier League clubs. Oh, 100%. I mean, I think it already is doing that a little bit, partly because the league is so competitive and that's the, like when you've got, like in Italy, where you've got Juventus, Fiorentina sort of getting a little bit left behind, uh, Milan coming on board, like that it, you, you've got the tops of the trees, the top of the league at a very good level, like in France with Lyon and PSG or Spain with Barca and Atletico, like, and the rest are just sort of very, very routine, uh, routine games uh, every week for those teams. Um, whereas, you know, you look at uh, the WSL and you've got Brighton ending Chelsea's incredible unbeaten run and you've got Reading taking points off Man United to uh, hit their their chances of Champions League uh, football next season. And that, for me, that's the biggest thing is that the league overall is getting more competitive. And I think that then drives the desire of clubs in in Europe but then you on the converse you've got the fact that obviously in the Champions League if you've got say for Leon on P- Leon and PSG um just you know two big games a season in the league they are able to focus fully on the Champions League so i think you know you've then got the issue of the fact that a competitive league makes makes it harder for english teams to be successful in the Champions League because they can't you know focus all their attention on those games so you've got a sort of swings and roundabout effect of good league versus good uh, uh, good Champions League run which is exactly the conversation we've had at times of the Premier League as well so in some ways even that it's growth right like it's what it feels like sorry my dog is is on one <laughs> Susie um Nikki's dog isn't the only angry man who who gets very exercised at talk or you know of this game no one is forcing him to watch um do you foresee it a time when because you know alex scott was appointed presenter of football focus yesterday the comments on the daily mail and daily mirror which were the two i i had my attention drawn to were predictably tragic and depressing and in a a way amusing uh, because it is nice to see people having their piss boiled by something so unimportant um do you foresee a time when you will be able to write an article about women's football that doesn't have to be pre-moderated or doesn't have comments telling you to get back in the kitchen and stop wasting everyone's time? Or is that just something you're resigned to having to put up with forever? 
good question. I think I'm resigned to having to put up with it forever, but I always find it quite funny um, that people care enough to go online and and, and comment. Um, like, I think you're always going to get people who, regardless of whether they even think it, are going to do it because it is fun to troll. I think people like being trolls. So I think you're always going to get from that that point of view. Um, I found the Alex Scott thing absolutely hilarious because people are slagging off the fact that she apparently hasn't played football um, when she's, you know, well-capped international as opposed to Dan Walker, that famous uh, famous England international, um, really, really got me uh, tickled. But... Um, but yeah, no, I don't. I don't think we're ever going to reach a point where, but beyond that, I think it will reduce um, in that people won't won't be saying it in a genuine way. But you'll still get, you know, the trolls that just enjoy the wind up doing it. I mean, but I do think that idea, and it might be a generational thing that for young boys now, women's football will be on TV. It'll exist. It didn't exist when I was ten. Like there was just nowhere for me to see it. Now that doesn't mean I'm angry about it existing. It certainly doesn't mean I'm angry about who presents football focus. But uh, but I, I maybe that will You're still angry about who presents soccer AM. <laughs> <laughs> but you see my point. Like there'll be hopefully there'll be fewer just because it won't be like there won't be people who are just ingrained and incapable of expanding their mind, I guess. This is like an imperfect parallel, but I know from, I'm doing less of it these days, but I've covered the NFL for The Guardian for a long time. And I know that the number of comments on NFL articles, when we were first doing NFL articles for The Guardian, there was way more, why is this on this website? And after a while, people do get bored. People just sort of stop doing it. And so I I do think that changes over time. My little brother um, watched the England game uh, the other night and he's uh he's six years old um and he, he turned to my dad and he said uh women aren't very good at football are they my dad had to explain no that it was just england that weren't very good at football and what sexism <laughs> was um which, which which opened up a nice chat between them but yeah hopefully we will get to a point where he's watching some games where there's actually some good football played and that that is the effect susie are there any uh teams that are not in WSL at the moment that you know, have got sort of strong men's teams that are now looking to sort of pump mon- money into the, the women's game. Any that we should be looking out for? Yeah, there's a few. Um, Southampton um, are putting a lot of work in. They've got Marianne Spacey, the former in- England international, uh, like running their women's setup and managing their women's team. They they've been top. They're top of the league with the curtailed uh, league at the moment. I think they're in tier three or four. They were top of the league when the season was curtailed last season. So, in theory, they should be promoted uh, already um, and haven't been. And there's a few teams like that. Um, and there's a couple of teams that um, are really exciting, like Ipswich Town, who are one of the few lower lower tier women's teams that have uh, a really, really good um, academy structure where a lot of like England youth players go and play in the Ipswich first team and are playing in the England youth teams. Um, and that's like quite an exciting team to watch. Watford were responsible for sort of pulling their women's team and refusing to sort of fund them into the semi-professional championship when they were in that league and they chose to drop down a tier, but now they're battling to uh, to get back up. There's, there's a bunch are really great. And Leicester City are coming up this season, well, next season. Um, they've already won promotion from the championship and they have been doing loads with their women's team, um, like really took them... The club took the the team sort of more under the wing of the of the club last season, and they went fully professional in the semi professional league in preparation for coming up into the WSL. And I think they're they it's going to be great to see them coming up into WSL because they're really 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 committed to investing in the team. But they've got um, uh, Heskey as a as a ambassador for the side, and is like you know putting his arm around the players a little bit and uh and giving them advice and things too and it's they, they've really like integrated them into the into the setup so there's there's a few a few that are uh are really really kind of pulling their pulling their sides in uh Susie thanks for coming on appreciate it no worries thanks guys uh Susie Rack there uh the Guardian's women's football correspondent uh finally Terence says not a question but I really relate with the person who said they don't watch games anymore get their updates via football weekly and he says, and cough other podcasts. I don't know what that means. I support Manchester United. I will grudgingly watch their games, but absolutely nothing else. Thanks for keeping me informed. This new generation of people who don't see any of the football and we are their only uh, uh, window into what's happening. Um, we appreciate you greatly. Uh, and that'll uh, do. The, the, yes? the, sorry, just, um, I mean, there's, there's a huge uh, section of 
Mark Ramone and Simon Mayo's audience who listen to their film podcast but never watch the movies they're talking about. And Ellis, Mike Bobbins and Steph Guerrero's socially distant sports pod. That's all, well, a lot of it is based on watching documentaries and watching clips, but a huge part of their audience don't watch the clips they're talking about. Are there any other podcasts it's, it's, you want to recommend, Barry? I, I, I haven't <laughs> listened to Commode in a while, but I was always one of those people. I barely see any movies, but I used to really enjoy listening to those mm. two just because cause they bicker and it's fun. <laughs> Anyone else want to recommend other podcasts? I used to enjoy <laughs> listening to them, and now I don't because I just got sick of them. And now I worry that people who used to enjoy listening to us don't anymore because they've got sick of us. So maybe we shouldn't. Well, I'm sick busy. of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway that'll do for today uh barry thank you for your time you're welcome uh, thanks nikki thanks Max. cheers mark thanks max uh, we'll be back on monday for more great podcasts from the guardian just go to theguardian.com slash podcasts <laughs>